Anyway, speaking of knowing people, I want to say this real quick. We're going to get to the Kevin Sullivan interview, but um, I want to thank everybody for the great response to my appearance on the Brawl for All episode of Dark Side of the Ring on Vice. As we know, Dark Side of the Ring airs every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern on Vice TV, and I, w- I will be... I have been involved already in a couple of them, and you'll probably see me popping up a time or two again. Um, but I have I trended on Twitter again, and this time just for not doing anything bad. Um, but I have apparently, from the comments, been vindicated after all these years. Now that people have seen Shitstain talk about wrestling in his natural habitat, with that voice and that face and the whole package, People are astonished that I didn't strangle him 20 years ago. I've never seen such... People are saying things about shit stain that I've never even dreamed of saying. And I'm writing a lot of them down because I'm going to steal them. But God, I've never seen (laughs) one one television program make a motherfucker so unpopular. Uh, That was... (sighs) So thank everybody for your feedback, and now you see what I was fucking dealing with. But we wanted to talk a little bit about the Dark Side of the Ring episode, uh, just in what they... They've only got to 45 minutes, and, you know, they could have just showed me talking about the whole thing for 45 minutes, and it wouldn't have been as exciting visually, but you'd had a lot more of the details. But I wanted to uh, uh, go over a couple things that that I don't I think they they left out time wise possibly interest wise the biggest problem to me well let's start at this at the start whose idea not whose idea was it but who inspired Vince Russo to come up with this idea because he's saying now he's been telling for the last few years that he heard well I heard that John Bradshaw Layfield in the in the catering or wherever, and he was talking about how tough he was. And I just, boy, I wanted to see somebody knock him out. He basically, he says he started this whole fiasco because he wanted to see Bradshaw get fucking punched out and embarrassed. And when the guys that Jason Eisner and and Evan Husney were down here were taping, they asked me, and this part was edited out. I said, I don't, I can't put it past him for a stupid reason like that. And that's why I said, can you imagine being intellectually and morally bankrupt enough to go through all this just to embarrass a a fucking bully? But like a lot of Russo's stories, it doesn't pan out. The timeline doesn't work. There's not a lot of evidence to support it. And it wasn't told until years after the fact. Now, the reason why I can't totally discount it is because with Russo, you never know. At that point in time, especially, he'd only been in the fucking locker room for a year. He might have heard the guys fucking around with each other and bought it and thought they were serious because he was that much of a mark. But Bradshaw, was, if even if he was a bully, and it seems like this story has only popped up over the last few years when stories about Bradshaw bullying people became fashionable, right? That's when Russo started telling him, wow, I wanted to get even with that bully. But, Brian, the year was 1998. Bradshaw could not have been a bully then, even if he was a bully. He was just out of the, not even barely out of the new blackjacks, for fuck's sake. Uh, He had only been in the company for two years. He'd come in, he'd already had a couple of gimmick changes. He was an underneath guy, not knocking his talent or whatever the fuck, but he was being used in the middle of the card, if that with no established real strong gimmick and there was nobody. And the plus he's in a locker room with fucking Dan Severn and Steve Blackman and Ken Shamrock. And fuck is at that time, John Bradshaw Layfield was not going to be a bully to anybody. And I was around him a lot at that point. Not only did I, I've never had a problem with Bradshaw, but I never saw that at that time, especially where he was even ribbing anybody excessively because he was still at the, at the phase where he was happy to be there. So, so that, to me, does not make sense, but it's a good story that Vince Russo could make up if, indeed, he wanted to make up a story about, you know, a reason for this to make himself look like a baby face when Bradshaw started getting heat for being a bully to people. Well, I, I, I wanted to take him down myself. He just wants to... He's a fucking... 
wagon hopper. He wants to hop on the fucking wagon, but he drags his feet. What do you um, remember about how it was first pitched to Vince or how you first heard about it? Well, it, it see, that's the problem is I was off the creative team by that point, so I don't know how it was first pitched. But when I first heard about it, the impression that all of us had initially, and I'll, I'll go into more of this in a second, but a lot of the, you got to remember a lot of the boys, when you hear Bart Gunn talk or you hear the, any of the boys talk, most of the guys, all the guys in the tournament at that time had never been in the office, had never been part of a booking team or booking committee or bookers themselves. And they see things related to their own personal position, which is natural. But whereas a lot of guys saw that there was some deep seated meaning to this at start, or that somehow there was punishment afterwards that was designed for this or whatever, I guarantee goddamn to you. And that's nothing. Russo already admitted in the show. He would sit and, and watch he and fucking Ferrara would watch Jerry Springer all day and write the wrestling program. I guarantee you that one of the Vince's, probably Russo, saw some television piece somehow on mixed martial arts, ultimate fighting, or even a tough man contest. And because you know how people get a germ of an idea and then somebody else says something and you've seen something on TV and whatever the fuck. And that's the way songs are written and fucking books are written and etc. You had, I had tried to get them to do Severn and Shamrock three on pay-per-view and had sent copious notes on what you could do with Dan Severn. You couldn't do with Dan Severn, etc. But that had never uh, manifested itself but then suddenly we hear well we're gonna have a brawl for all and bruce i remember bruce explaining it to me because he's always the explainer as we said on the drive through this last week he'll explain it exactly like vince wants it explained i said you got to be out of your fucking mind what do they do oh no it could be great corny vince russo had the barest idea that there was something going on called ultimate fighting I don't even know whether they were calling it mixed martial arts yet. This was still before Dana White had bought the company when they'd been kicked off pay-per-view, but they had done those massive pay-per-view buys. And there was still, there was an underground buzz about it. If, and if he was keeping up with ECW, then he probably knew something about this. But because Russo didn't know anything about the rules of pro wrestling to begin with, he definitely didn't know anything about mixed martial arts fighting or what the UFC was legitimately doing. And I'm sure when he pitched it to Vince McMahon, Vince always like, oh, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll really be laying the leather in there, pal, because he was a boxing guy. If he's thinking of real fighting, he's thinking of boxing because he's been a pay-per-view promoter. And at the time, that's what ruled pay-per-view was boxing. And he probably, the tough man contest, that probably appealed to Vince's macho fucking whatever he's got going on where, yeah. Yeah, we'll put gloves on them. They have the big gloves on because that they use the big gloves. So nobody will get hurt, but boy, they'll fucking swing and blah, blah, blah. And <clears throat> basically, you had two Vinces together that neither one of them knew anything about the burgeoning mixed martial arts scene, ultimate fighting championship, what it was really about, doing some kind of weird offshoot with all of the supposed tough guys that they had on the roster. And all those guys were tough in their normal elements. But besides the fact that neither one of them, I mean, you know, Shane, as, as you'll recall, before Dana White bought the UFC, Shane wanted Vince to buy it and got mad when he didn't buy it, from what I heard. <clears throat> and that may have led to Shane leaving and going, didn't he invest in an in a oriental uh, mixed martial arts company at some point in time or whatever? I'm not sure, but, you know, I used to work with Bob Myrowitz and he's the founder and creator of the UFC, or, well, founder yeah. and first owner of the UFC with uh, SEG, Semaphore Entertainment Group, and he told me a story once that he was in New York at a restaurant, and this was after they had, Shane had wanted to buy it, and that VC's Vince, and he knows Vince. I mean, they're both pay-per-view big shots. Yeah. And he sees Vince with some guy, and he goes, hey, Vince, how are you? And Vince goes, Bob, I want you to meet my son-in-law, Triple H. And Bob thought he was joking. He's like, there's no way Vince would marry his daughter off to some wrestler. Oh, my God. And he said, he goes, I remember looking at him and thinking, he's joking. And then I realized he wasn't joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so they've got the barest idea of how something like this will work. 
and they're going to put these guys in it. And I immediately raised all the red flags, which nobody listened to anyway. What the fuck? Number one, if it's supposedly a shoot, then that makes everything else we're doing a fucking work. It exposes the wrestling business. Number two, once I heard the fucking rules, you've got all American wrestlers who are going to have to compete with fucking boxing gloves on. You've got guys that have fought in tough man contests, but fucking takedowns are legal. Uh, there have never been rules, and th this is something I stressed with the dark side guys, but it was too inside baseball. They cut it out. Just the whole idea that the rules were neither fish nor foul. They had never, there had never been competitive fights staged under these rules. The rules weren't even finalized until they were still tinkering with them two or three weeks in. Uh, it, it, it would show everybody at their worst because the wrestlers can obviously take the boxers if they can take them to, but you couldn't submit anybody because there was no submissions and you were, you're wearing boxing gloves. So you take them down. You have to let them back up. It benefit the, the rules. And then I said, you're putting a lot of money on the line for these guys. So they're going to really fight. And then you're going to have ill will. <clears throat> and I said, they're not trained for competition. So even if they're in wrestling shape, they may not be in competition shape. Well, that proved to be a fucking prophetic statement when everybody got hurt. And I hated the thing from the fucking start. Um, but another rumor or, you know, uh, longstanding fucking belief has come about that JR said, okay, this will be Doc's that JR was somehow behind it because he either wanted Dr. Death to win it or was a, you know, whatever the fucker was trying to get him to win it. JR heard the idea, and instead of me, because we're two different personalities, I just mentioned everything that was fucking wrong with it, and it was stupid because Vince Russo was behind it, and it made no sense. JR, being more level headed than I am, said, All right, if we're going to do this fucking thing, he didn't like it any better than I did, but how can. How can it work? How can it serve us somehow? How can we do some good with it? Dr. Death had just been signed. <laughs> and I don't care if any of the fans think, oh, well, why the fuck would they think that Dr. Death was going to win it just automatically unless the fix was in? No. If you were in the wrestling business at that period of time and you'd been in the business for any length of time and somebody said Dr. Death Steve Williams is going to be in a shoot fight, there was no doubt who was going to fucking win it. It was going to be Dr. Death and all things being equal without the screwy rules and just the stupidity. Yes, Doc would have won it. Um, but the idea that Jr. was then trying to make it happen that way was ridiculous because the, tar the whole tournament was fucked up. The bracketing was never consistent. They didn't know what the fuck they were doing. From the start, Severn won his opening round match because all he did was just take Godfather down over and over because Godfather had no defense for a UFC Hall of Famer taking him down. But once he took him down, he couldn't fucking do anything with him because he had to let him back up, and he's wearing gloves. And I heard at the time, and I never had any reason to doubt it, Dan later on has said that he's told to fucking pull out, but it, it, Dan Severn was a UFC Hall of Famer and was the most decorated amateur and professional athlete in this fucking competition decorated in amateur wrestling, AAU and Olympic style rest, everything. And it uh, had that UFC record. His first fight in, I remember him telling me after his first fight that any fucking putts could win this thing because the way the scoring was, the point system was the fucking rules of the whole thing. And, and he pulled out to salvage his reputation and then, you know, he said that they told him to pull out. I can't say whether they did or not, but it was a good decision. Wasn't Ken Shamrock asked to be in it and he refused because he actually yes. wanted to train? Because he actually knew that you need to train to do something like this. You can't just go into it willy-nilly. Well, I think that was his excuse because he was like, wait a minute, once again, I'm a fucking real professional with a real goddamn uh, uh, reputation. And yes, people, if they if I'm doing worked pro wrestling, that's one thing. But if I'm losing a fight to a fucking guy who's never had a professional fight before for real because of this stupid fucked up rule system they've got that could have done damage to him. And so either way, he didn't want to, he didn't want to do it because it was stupid. So, um, then 
poor Bart feels like that he was uh, punished because Doc didn't win it. And everybody knows the story. They didn't go into it specifically there if you didn't already kind of know it to begin with. But Doc came out. Nobody was going to knock Doc out. You know, Bart hit like a fucking brick, right? But if Doc was mobile and hostile and could take people down or do whatever the fuck, but Doc comes out and fucking tears his goddamn hamstring, that goofy bump through the ropes did, uh, I can't remember whether that was it or whether he tore it trying to fucking lean into it afterwards. But anyway, he's a one-legged man in in an ass-kicking contest, and he just stood right in front of that fucking shot. And uh, uh, Dr. Death, after four four times All-American in wrestling, a pro for 20 fucking years, there are 15 years at that point, a fucking four-time All-American football player, he'd never fought with gloves on in his life. So it was just, it was just all goofy. And anyway, uh, Bart believes that he was punished, but the thing was, he wasn't punished because... The only plan to push anybody coming out of this thing, besides Vince Russo saying, well, whoever wins will be a big star, was, okay, this could get Doc ready to run with Steve Austin, because that's obviously why Dr. Death Steve Williams was there, to have a run with Steve Austin, where they, and Steve Austin would have loved to fucking work with Dr. Death, and Dr. Death could have been a heel that, as Steve, as hot as Austin was at that time, that the people believed could fucking break Austin into pieces and you would have had some pay-per-view matchups there. And they would have, and they were two straight ahead guys that would have probably done great working with each other. But Bart Gunn had been presented for five years as a middle card or underneath guy. First as a member of the team, even the smoking guns were more over than Bart Gunn was as a single at that time, not taking anything away from his talent, but because the way he had been presented. He wasn't just going to suddenly come in, do this tournament, win matches that were getting booed out of the building because it wasn't wrestling and the fans didn't want to see it, knock these guys out, and it's still the same Bart Gunn. And he's knocked out other guys that were in the middle of the card. Whether it was a shoot or work, didn't make any fucking difference. He was still beating other guys that were in the middle of the card or they wouldn't have been in that tournament to begin with. The only guy that was headed to the top was Dr. Death, and that was he was in it because he'd never backed down from a fight. He'd never lost a fucking fight, and he figured, okay, this will get me ready for a title shot. <clears throat> the winner was not automatically going to work with Steve Austin. If Dr. Death were, won the thing, he was going to work with Steve Austin, but you think if Godfather won, he was going to work with Steve Austin? No. So whatever they told Bart, and I can believe Bruce told him anything, it wasn't going to happen that way. They had no plan for how to push Bart Gunn because they didn't think Bart Gunn was going to win, but there wasn't really any way to push Bart Gunn otherwise than to send him away for six months to a year and have him come back with a different fucking look because they'd been using Bart Gunn. There was nothing different about him except he knocked out a bunch of other guys in the middle of the card and he knocked out Dr. Death who had never been in the WWE before and was just in the process of starting to get over. And the injury fucking finished that off. So there was no conspiracy to penalize Bart. It was just, what it, What are you going to do with him afterwards? He did what was best for him. He went to Japan with a new name and a whole new look and a new, et cetera, and he got over. <clears throat> and did, you know, fairly well in Japan for, you know, several years after that. But there was no punishment or whatever the fuck. Uh, for for doing that, it just that's the way that it worked out. And you didn't watch the After Dark show with Chris Githard, the the fucking host who looks like Carl Alfalfa Switzer and Squiggy had a fucking baby. Um, but they they did sh- they they showed a few clips and then they had a discussion and I just I, there were a few things that were brought up. Shitstein claimed that he had to sit and fire rapid fire ideas at Vince McMahon one right after another to see if anything stuck like it was his fucking chance to talk himself off the edge of a fucking cliff, right? No, that's not the way it worked. It's the way Russo made it work. Normal people, myself, Jim Ross, Bruce Pritchard, Pat Patterson, sat down and talked over ideas 
that made sense for the specific talent to get in some kind of a conflict, an incident or two to heat it up a little bit, and something that would sell tickets for the eventual match, hopefully on pay-per-view. Shitstain would blurt out, what about a fight in a bakery? Right? And then, yeah, he just saw things in his fucking head. People doing things in a strange place or whatever. And that's what he would blurt out. So, yes, that's how he worked with Vince because that's what it was. It was, I'm going to blurt shit out my ass until you like something. Um, as I mentioned, you know, once again, Dr. Death wasn't planned as the winner from the start. Everybody just figured he would win it. Nobody is getting this. Nobody in wrestling believed at the time, especially anybody had been around him or knew anything about him, that anybody could beat up Dr. Death in any way, shape, or form. So that's, that's that. Um, Butterbean wasn't picked as punishment. I remember when I first heard about that from Bruce Pritchard. Butterbean was, a, they would have rather had Butterbean than goddamn, at WrestleMania, than goddamn Holyfield, I think, at that point. Because Butterbean was a fucking gimmick. And not only that, but a gimmick that would work with them. Mike Tyson wasn't going to have a match. He'd do the referee thing for a couple million dollars, right? Well, that worked. But Butterbean, the king of the four rounders, he's a fucking physical mess. And, and now you saw the way he looked in the episode. But it like, Roy Nelson in, in the UFC for a while there. He's a gimmick. He looks like shit, but he can hit fucking hard, and he's a trained professional boxer. And he's the king of the four-rounders because he only has four-rounders because he couldn't fucking go past four rounds. But if he hits you inside those four rounds, he's going to fucking knock you out. Well, they, somebody saw him on news report on Butterbean. Well, that's something we could do with Bart. We could have it. The only reason Butterbean was there was not his punishment is because he was a gimmick fucking boxer. And he was looked like a gimmick, and he'd work with them, and he'd do it fairly cheap. And then they they really did send Bart. I I can guarantee you, Vince McMahon was behind this sending Bart to get real boxing lessons. Well, we want to don't want him to embarrass us, pal, or whatever the fuck, because they're thinking because they don't know any, and especially Russo doesn't know anything about any fucking form of combat sports. He's seeing Bart Gunn, 6'5", body looks like that. He knocked all these other guys out. Well, maybe he'll beat Butterbean. And if he does, then we'll get on ESPN. And if he doesn't, then what? it'll be fun. He didn't know he'd go 30 seconds and Bart would get fucking brain damage. But that was, it's, there was no grand plan to that either. That's why I'm trying to tell, tell you people, there was no grand plan to anything that Vince Russo ever came up with. It was all blurting shit out about stuff that had come across his mind because he'd seen some shit on TV and it made him think of something. Um, you know, it, 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 on the After Dark episode, he also, he wouldn't speak of me, but they played a clip uh, where we've told the story on here before, but where it acknowledged that I suckered him through giving Kenny Bolin a stooge test into putting that fucking restraining order out on me. Uh, and, and he expressed being dumb, dumbfounded or bum fuzzled that I would hate him over just wrestling. <clears throat> and in, in, in this case, or want to kill him over wrestling in this case. Yes, I do, by the way. But in this case, Brian, it was over this not being wrestling. The whole thing was, it was from the start. What I said to him and I said the same thing on the episode. I said to him in the, in the hallway after doc lost, I said, he just cost the company $5 million in one night. That would have been minimum. The pay-per-view revenue. We could have got off of Steve Austin versus Dr. Death, Steve Williams with the proper build, but it was over not being wrestling. This being a stupid idea that exposed the business, got people hurt, created ill feelings in the locker room having the guys fight for real under bullshit made up rules and that the fans hate it. So to be precise in this incident, I wanted to kill him over it, not being wrestling, but it just not only everybody noticing the way that he just has that slappable face and talks down to people, but the fact that he was dismissing the wrestling business as being so trivial and he didn't mind telling the guys to really shoot on each other. And until somebody pointed it out to him, 
that it was a bad look, as the kids say. He was laughing when he saw the the clip of JBL going into convulsions after he got knocked out. But he's talking about the wrestling business being so trivial. He didn't mind telling guys to shoot on each other, blah, blah, blah. And 30 seconds later, you see Draws in a wheelchair from one wrestling move. One wrestling move done by an excellent worker that's never hurt anybody else before or since. It wasn't a trivial thing to Draws. It wasn't a trivial thing to D'Lo. It wasn't a trivial thing to a lot of people, except this fucking jack-off that was gifted his entree into the business and proceeded to shit all over everybody in it. But, uh, and then at the, at the finish of the thing, Russo apologizes to Bart for not having anything to do with him or not doing anything with him afterwards, not having a follow-up. That's on me, bro. That's on me. An insincere, disingenuous effort to babyface himself when he could have just told the truth. It was a stupid idea and a, a shitty tournament that nobody liked, and I didn't know how to follow up on it, and it didn't get you over because people thought that it sucked and we had still been presenting you as a fucking underneath talent for the previous five years, so it didn't fucking help. But he's not smart enough to say that. So, but those those were the... Did you see anything else that was neglected in the Brawl for All rundown? Well, I think there are other people they could have talked to I would have loved to have seen Dan Severn in that. I've talked to Dan yeah. on 605 about Brawl for All. I think Ken Shamrock, I think that would have been interesting. I think, like you said, they should have talked a little bit about the rules. I think Timeline was slightly off on some things, but you kind of did a good rundown <laughs> of what really happened. A postmortem, if you will. 